there's a, it's hashtag our green fest is the hashtag we're using. So, um, well, we had it, uh, we had a Oh, look at no one's posted anything because we're all busy. <laughs> So in some stage we're going to have to do... Greenfest, there we go. So it is just Greenfest. Did you see what it actually... It's in the it's it's in the Greenfest added an event. It's the actual account name, because I tried to do... Um, at Greenfest? Uh, can I go to Greenfest home? Do you have, if you could go to my Facebook page now and see if just make sure you can see this and share it. Hang on, sir, I need to start this. Oh, is it 11 15? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was 11 15. Sorry. 11 15. That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see the church fill. <laughs> um, I have a couple of the normal announcements, and I apologize to those of you who were at the last talk because they're the same announcements. Um, We've never had a fire in this church, ever, before this bridge. Should there be a fire, uh, there are two exits. One the way you came in on that door there, and the other one is straight through the back. There's what's known as the west door, that's the other way you can get out. Um, I would ask you uh, to keep, the, the aisle in this church is very narrow, okay, so please keep it clear, so that if people do need to get in and out, they can. There are cables around, mainly down the front here. They have been fairly well taken down, but just be a little bit careful because there are cables on the floor, okay? particularly if you come up the front here. The other thing is that there may be some filming going on. They're taking various pictures and things uh, for the archives and for the Facebook and all that sort of stuff. If anybody wants or starts to take a photo and you don't really want to, <laughs> okay, so I've got great, great John, pleasure him, yeah. in introducing the next talk and speaker, which is the challenge of climate change. And we have with us to give that presentation Professor Sir Brian Hoskins. Now, Professor Brian Hoskins will be talking to us about the world leading net zero greenhouse gas target proposed by the Climate Change Committee and the actions government and businesses need to take to achieve that, the aims it sets out. Among the many notable positions held in a brief career as a climate change scientist, Sir Brian played a major part in the 2000 report by the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution that first proposed a 60% target for UK carbon dioxide reduction emissions reduction by 2050. In 2018, he completed 10 years as a member of the UK Committee on Climate Change. So it's a very, great pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. I also live in the neighbouring village of Pangborn, which is uh, perhaps why I'm here today. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, a pleasure to talk to you about climate change. I'll take you through some of the science. Having been at the back in the previous talk, I realised the screen is not necessarily vis very visible to everyone, so I'll, I'll try and make sure you understand what's there. So what I'm going to do is start with climate science. What is the basis for the problem that we're all discussing here? And the curve that I hope most of you can see here is actually the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's, the curve starts back here in 1957, when it was first measured routinely, and up to the present day. And there's a wiggly line here, the red one, which is 
associated with there being more vegetation in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, and the vegetation sucks in CO2 in the spring, breathes it out in the autumn. So ignoring that annual cycle there, you see the black curve, and it's going upwards there. And it's going upwards from about 317, when it was first measured here, up to somewhere more than 410 now. And we know that in the past million years, it's gone between about 180 and 280 in these units. So we took the scene here when we started our activities, and we took it from 280 about up to 400, more than 410. That's about a 50% increase. And we know that's due to us from all sorts of ways. Um, it's about half the amount that we think we've put into the atmosphere during the uh, Industrial Revolution and post that. So um, it's due to us. And having put it in the atmosphere, we know also it's going to be there for a very long time. So every time you drive down the road with a, a petrol car or a diesel car, the carbon dioxide you produce is going to influence the amount in the atmosphere for the next thousand years. So it's not something you can say, well, I'll just stop now and it will all go away. I'm afraid not. This is a long-term problem we have here. And we also know that this carbon dioxide will warm the atmosphere. The science behind that is not new. It's not people like me trying to get a career from it and just making it up. It's been known since the 19th century. Essentially, if you have a, a greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide, it allows the sun's radiation to come through. So it doesn't get in the way of that. But the heat given off by the Earth is absorbed by a gas like carbon dioxide. And then it's re-emitted where it's colder in the atmosphere. So it acts as a sort of blanket around the Earth, keeping us warmer than we would be. In fact, without these greenhouse gases, we would have a frozen planet, so we wouldn't be here. So it's wonderful, these greenhouse gases. However, it's an example where too much of a good thing is not necessarily good. So the greenhouse gases make our planet habitable, but we are adding to them. We're adding carbon dioxide, but we're also adding some others, and those others, methane, nitrous oxide, and a few others, add about 20% more effect than the carbon dioxide. So that's what we're doing to the climate system, we're warming it. And we know the only way to stop that will be to stop adding greenhouse gases. That's the only way to stop the planet warming. As long as we go on emit carbon dioxide in particular, the planet will go on warming. So um, if we can have the next one. So here's, oops, here's the planet warming. I'm showing you one way of showing this. This starts back in 1870, and you can see some blue curves perhaps here. And it's the annual cycle that goes around here. And this is up to the 1950s now, and it's warming. This is the start here. This is one and a half degrees out here. So we're now in the, and the red ones here are the last few years. So I hope you can see this spiral of the climate system warming. Um, it will start again. There's all sorts of ways of showing this. Is Ed Harrison um, at the University of Reading has these nice ways of showing this here. So you can see the temperatures in the around 1900 were around here. 1940s were around here. Then 1970s around here. 1990s around here. And the 2010s were up to here, basically. So we're... The world has warmed by slightly more than one degree in that period that I've been showing you there. So what goes along with that? Well, a lot of things go along with that. The, uh, the world has warmed. Um, warmer air holds more water. And it's an amazingly large effect. If the atmosphere is six degrees warmer, it can hold 50% more water. And it usually does. So six degrees warming, there's half as much again, water in the atmosphere. So the same storm, if the atmosphere is six degrees warmer, will give you 50% more rainfall. So heavy rainfall is what we expect with a warming climate system, and that's what we're seeing almost everywhere. I think most of us have experienced that, and certainly around the world. There's many other things that go with that, but I'm just going to show two here. The Arctic sea ice. Um, this was actually 
from the 4th of September, so how many days ago was that? What are we on? About five days ago, yeah. So, um, and maybe you can't see too well. This is Greenland here, this is the Alaska here, and this is Russia around here. And this, you can't see this cover, unfortunately, but that's where the, the average of the ice back in from the 1981 to 2010, and this is what it's like now. So by the time we get to the minimum in slightly later September, we're almost down to half the area of sea ice there used to be. It grows again in the winter, um, but the rate of decline is such that by the middle of this century, around then, the sea ice will disappear in September. It will grow again um, through the next winter, but it will be only fresh ice and there won't be quite as much as it. So that is clearly bad news for the polar bears and for the, all the natural species around, and also for people who live around there as well with this warming system. They've got used to dealing with the cold system, with permafrost, etc. The curve I'm showing over here is sea level, and it shows this is back 1993, and that's up to last year. And there's wiggles again on this, but then a smooth curve through the shows a rise and a slightly accelerating rise. And that rise is now equivalent to slightly more than three millimetres per year. That doesn't sound much, but it's 30 centimetres per 100 years. And it's closer to four now, so 40 centimetres per 100 years. So the sea level rise, why does the sea level rise? Well, we think of melting ice on the land and the glaciers have been melting, but the main effect in the past has been actually the expansion of the ocean. As the ocean warms, it doesn't expand a lot, but the ocean is four kilometres deep, so it doesn't have to expand much for sea level to rise. And most of this is due to the expansion of the ocean. But then, increasingly, in this period here where it's rising more rapidly, we know now that Greenland, the melting of Greenland ice cap, and to a smaller extent, the Antarctic, West Antarctic ice cap is starting to contribute. And we expect to see an increasing impact from those. In fact, the destabilization of the Greenland ice sheet is something that we think will occur at some temperature rise, but it may take a thousand years or many thousand years, but it may be almost irreversible for a certain temperature rise. So that's what we're seeing there. And let me just say, in terms of temperature rise, even if we stopped warming the climate system now, the ocean, the sea level, would go on rising for the next thousand years because it's a very long-term effect. The turning over the ocean, the bottom of the ocean doesn't yet know that it's warm and it takes a long time to find out. So the sea level will go on rising um, whatever we do now. But if we do something, then it will rise at a very slow rate. Okay. So, oh gosh, this really isn't visible, but I thought I'd show you one picture of what the world might look like towards the end of this century if we don't um, uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And you can't see much of a splodge here, but the red is, so this shows that the Earth, the UK, we're here now, um, but I, you clearly can't see the detail here. But at the end of the century, over most of the ocean, the temperature rise was probably more, something like three degrees, but over the land, it's even over the tropics, it's about five degrees. So the warmest parts of the planet would be five degrees warmer. You imagine pre monsoon India, where it's already almost unbearable, then you add five degrees to that. So human activity becomes extremely difficult under those circumstances, and the growth of crops becomes very difficult. In the higher latitudes, the warming is more like eight, 10 degrees, and in winter, maybe something like 12 degrees or so. So you can imagine what that would do to permafrost. We're looking at huge changes there, taking the planet to somewhere it hasn't been, well, certainly there's been any human beings around. And um, the temperature contrast, because it's not uniform, weather feeds off temperature contrast. So if you change the temperature contrast between one place and another, then the weather will be different. So it's not just a question of being warmer, it's different weather as well, and of course the heavy rainfall would be that much more. So, um, just taking us on then, this is 
a little thermometer here, and it's uh, taken from a Royal Society report that I chaired, which uh, back in last November. So this is the pre-industrial temperature. This is about where we are today, and increasing about one degree for 50 years. And this is where everyone over since the last 25 years or more internationally has said we should try and stop the temperature going above rise going above two degrees. That was defined as dangerous climate change. If you live on an island in the Indian Ocean, it's already dangerous because the sea level's rising. But anyway, internationally, that's what was agreed. And, and this is where we'll be by the end of the century if we keep going as we are and go beyond that. So I've got here, this is also used as the basis for the UK target in the 2008 Climate Change Act. So this is something that if you're not aware of, you should be, because this is something to be proud of our country. And this went through Parliament with 450 voting for it and five against. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> so there's everyone thought, everyone bar five, thought that this was a good idea to have this Climate Change Act from 2008. And um, down here, you maybe can't see it, this is about a programme of adaptation in the UK and how we put that programme together. So that's important, adapting to climate change. We've already changed the climate. Whatever we do now, the climate will change more. Um, and we have to adapt to that. It may be the Thames barrier, the next plans for the next 10 bar barrier are in place to actually cope with a two meter sea level rise. So the expectation is it wouldn't be more than a meter by the, in the time of the next barrier, but the plans are there. Some places we're not doing a good job, we're still building in floodplains and that's clearly not good news. But, um, so adapting to climate change is that part. This part is the mitigation, that means the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. And there's a target here of an 80% reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And that was a really exciting target when that was put there. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. And knowing that politicians tend to say, oh, 2050 is too far off, we won't do anything, there's actually a very good system here of five-year carbon budgets. So they're already set up to the year 2032. So they're in place, those carbon budgets, to lead us on the way to the 2050 target. And the government of the day is legally required to have the policies to meet those targets, both these, these carbon budgets and the final target. So not just the present target, but they must be getting the policies to meet the future targets. And finally, there's the establishment of an independent advisory body, the Committee on Climate Change, and I was a member of that for its first 10 years. And this is another really great thing about the Act, getting an independent committee to advise, to report to Parliament on how we're doing, and to advise on what the target should be and what the policies, what sort of policies there might be. So, for instance, we advised on this 80% um, target there, and let me just tell you how we, we came to that. We said, well, the, there's been the decision the, the temperature should not go above, above two degrees. And from the science, we realized that that means certain things about the, the way we must reduce the emissions globally. And then we said, well, what does that mean by 2050? And if you divide it equally amongst all the citizens of the world, who we expect to be there by 2050, then it means two tonnes of carbon dioxide emission per year, per person. We were at 10 tonnes, so we said the only way we can expect an agreement is with equity, each citizen of the world being allowed the same emissions. So we must go from 10 tonnes to two tonnes by 2050. So how are we doing? I hope you can see some of this. This was from our 2018 progress report to Parliament. Um, these lines here are the blue, uh, are the targets that have been set and agreed by Parliament. And you can see this is how we've been doing, and we're meeting the first one and we'll meet the second one. 
However, with the present policies, we're only likely to get there, and these are the targets we should have. We should really be down here. If we're going to go to the 20% target or even the newer one, new policies are required. And we've been telling the government for some years new policies are required, and um, we will, no doubt, the Climate Change Committee will continue to say that. So, what's the, we've been also saying, support the low hanging fruit option. Don't keep chopping and changing policy. There's so many examples of that. And regulation is important in many areas, such as buildings. Put them in where they're required and act now so that we do have possibilities for the long term. How have we been doing in the various sectors? Well, the success story is our electricity supply. And that's been a closing of the coal power stations. It's been the tremendous development of wind power, both onshore and offshore, and an increasing contribution from solar, so and gas, and then nuclear. So we've managed to reduce our emissions by a large proportion, 60%, in our electricity supply. And we need to continue that. There's been some success in waste by capturing methane. A little in industry, but most of that's to do to industry shutting down or anything else. And really, across the board here, there's almost no progress. Yet we know how to do it. Agriculture is more difficult. But Buildings were building, we, our buildings would be laughed at in the rest of Europe for how much energy they need. So that, and we know how to do it. The, the policies were in place that we should have zero carbon buildings by 2016, but in 2015, the government of the day got rid of the policy. So we've done nothing there. Transport, we know about electric vehicles, the petrol vehicle is much more efficient than it used to be. But look, it's even gone up. So the, the total lack of policies there to make this happen. We see bigger and bigger vehicles as they get more efficient. And the electric vehicles are ready to take off and they certainly should be. So policies required there. So now we, we've seen this side of the thermometer before. But when, then we come to the Paris Agreement back in 2015. Tremendous agreement around the world, record time for a UN um, agreement to be ratified. And the agreement in Paris was that the, we should be aiming below two degrees, not two degrees itself, but below that. And even an aspiration that the rise should only be one and a half. But we're there now, so it's not very far away. And so that's what Paris said we'd like to do. Then another part of the Paris Agreement is to actually say to countries, well, what do you volunteer that you will, you will, what are your pledges for your own emission reductions? And if you add those up, then they're below here, but even optimistically, they're three degrees or slightly more. So we haven't got there yet. However, there is a start. And an important thing is that in the UK will be the, the really important meeting after Paris, will take here in 20, place here in 2020. Uh, so that's something to look for in November, December 2020. And the big hope there is that the countries of the world will revise their pledges to bring them down to here. That's got to be the pressure, and that's the hope. So why is it possible to do so much better than we thought before? Well, I put a picture of a windmill here. You probably can't see it, but the um, wind Energy now, onshore and offshore, is so much more efficient than expected. Solar as well. So, in most places of the world now, the cheapest way to create electricity is no longer using fossil fuel, it's using wind power and solar. That's the cheap way to generate electricity. So it's becoming easy to do the right thing. And that's, that means that really takes off. The electric vehicle, you can see some of those, in my youth, the electric vehicle was the milk float, but now it's the Tesla. You know, so the exciting vehicle now is the electric vehicle, and that's really where the whole thing is going. Just an amazing, I've driven one of those Teslas, so just an amazing thing. No noise whatsoever. You put your foot down there, 
you just want, it's just an amazing feeling. Now, if someone wants to hear the noise, you can give them earphones and it could go vroom, vroom, or whatever, but it's not necessary anymore. Um, there's a passive house here, carbon neutral house, zero carbon emissions. We can do that. It's, when you build a house, it's not much more expensive than the ordinary rubbish that's built in this country. If you try and retrofit, it is more expensive, but it's still not that expensive. And then ways of doing it with carbon dioxide, the, the emissions from a chimney stack can be, the CO2 can be taken out and can be liquefied and either used or put underground. And we have to do that sort of thing in the future. And at last there's some effort to try and do that. One of the, so I've said the technologies have changed, I and mean, I think another thing that's changed is actually the noise one is hearing from around about we need to do something about this. And I put something up about the children's strike here. There's Greta down there, who's been an amazing influence on the world. And here we have Extinction Rebellion as well, um, who have certainly been making a noise as well as stopping the traffic in London. And these, all this sort of pressure here, along with what people have been saying and David Attenborough's programs and other things, there's a lot more welling up of something must be done about this. And um, so that's the other aspect that's really changed. So, um, so following things happening internationally, the Paris and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, then the UK government eventually asked the Climate Change Committee, should we be changing our targets? And in May of this year, the Climate Change Committee produced a report, and the answer they gave was, we should be going aiming now, no longer an 80% reduction, we should be going for a 100% reduction by 2050. And it's possible, because of these advances in technology, um, we know how to do it now. It's also possible because many companies and the industries see the advantages of actually being the first movers here to actually go for the new industries, not flogging away on the old dirty ones. It's no longer muck, uh, muck is brass or whatever the phrase was. You know, it's now clean is brass. That's where the money is in future and that's the industries we have to develop. And the Climate Change Committee gave that argument, but they also gave another one that I'd like to tell you about too. But let me just explain these curves here. This is the emissions per person in the UK. So it was around 1990, around 14, and currently it's somewhere around slightly below 8. So nearly half, which is impressive. And then this is the world average per capita emissions. So the UK emissions are just about down to the global average now. And the blue curves here are roughly where those emissions should go if we're going to hit two degrees, keep below two degrees, or the orangey ones here, or pink, whatever colour you can see, is if we're aiming for one and a half degrees. And both of these say that in the second part of this century, the greenhouse gas emissions should go to zero, and even below zero perhaps, but to go to zero in the second half. But the Climate Change Committee said, okay, rather than saying the second half of the century, we should make the zero 2050. And as well as the opportunities provided that, they also gave the, the moral argument that we led the world in terms of the industrial revolution using fossil fuel. And we should lead the world into the next industrial revolution without fossil fuel. So that's the aim it was. So I'm reaching the end here, but we, we can meet this challenge, but will we? And on the left hand side, these are not anything to do with parties, these colours. This is blue here, is all the reasons we can do it. So, when I first started, my first public talk on climate change was in 1985. Um, so I've been talking about it rather a long time. And climate change then, well, the mayor of Scarborough, where I gave it, I think he thought, well, if we got a bit warmer, that would be rather nice, you know. So. <laughs> and, but it wasn't really a visible thing to anyone, and it wasn't seen as damaging. I think now we've, we're all aware 
We've seen the floods even locally, and we're aware of the problems. So climate change is now visible and it's damaging. And if you're in the path of one of these hurricanes that's got a bit more energy, you also realise it. The amazing developments in technology, it's seen as a future in many ways. And we do have the countries of the world already committed somewhere, not far enough, and the peer pressure on those, um, the world leadership opportunity for China, for instance, is one of the drivers for them to really come down and take this further. But on, on the other side, we have some of the things also around, around the rise of populism, the vested interest that you see everywhere. Um, I've been uh, quite confronted with that many times over the last 30 years. I tell you, there are people coming from all sorts of ways and uh, um, dependent on the interest behind them. The money and influence in old industries too. Where is the money? Well, it's in the oil industry, it's whatever. That's what has the money. The new industries are starting off and they don't yet have the power to actually really say which, what we should do. Selfishness. Well, I'm afraid people tend to think of what they want, and we heard about greed in the previous lecture, and countries trying to get the advantage over others and make sure that they've got it. And so we should keep our greenhouse gas emissions, those others can do it. You know, so, and the lack of concern for the future. I mean, it, we do have this challenge. Can we really think of someone else 50 years, 100 years ahead? And that's a challenge to our species. And it's one we've got to face. Economic problems, always if we say, governments will say, OK, we've got a problem with the economy now. We'll come back to this in five, 10 years' time when we've sorted that out. We can't wait. The climate system cannot wait. And negotiations easily get bogged down. Well, I think we're all too aware of that, too. So there's many problems there, but um, there's Greta again there, and I changed my talk to put her on. I thought this was rather nice. Of course we need hope. The one thing we need more than hope is action. Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. Yeah, we need to act here, and we can do it. So um, I've been talking about a lot of things which are really quite a lot to do with government, but I thought I'd finish with what can people do. So, so this is something produced by the, um, the Institute I'm chair of at Imperial College, the Grantham Institute. And I've got 50 copies of this at the back so you can take your copy away. So it's nine things you can do about climate change. And number one is make your voice heard. So we live in a democracy. We should be telling our councillors, our MPs, our neighbours, anyone we can get I think this is incredibly important and you need to do what you can. And then there's other things about what you can do. Eat less meat and dairy. It's not saying give it up completely. It's just saying be more moderate, but better for your health as well. Cut back on flying. Again, it's, don't say don't. It's just saying, well, think about it. Do you need to do it? And go cut back on it if you can. Leave your car at home. Is there a public transport way of doing what you want to do, or walking, or cycling? Um, reduce your energy use and bills. Um, well, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. So, how do you do that? Well, is your home properly insulated? Are you using, when you go and buy the next refrigerator, are you looking for a triple plus, or are you looking for a glossy cabinet? You have to decide what your priorities are. Um, Open spaces, so again, important in our cities and our, our countryside as well. We, we have to protect those, they are important in the whole cycle of carbon dioxide and in the temperatures of a city, for instance. If we get rid of the green spaces in the city, that city can easily be many degrees warmer and then everyone's grasping for their air conditioning and that uses energy and we're going further downstream. Attract trees per Planting trees is an important part of the UK program, it should be anyway. When you, if you have some money, think about how that money is really being invested. And that's increasingly important for many companies. They're starting to feel the risk as there's divestment threat or even happening. So consumption and waste, uh, again, cutting down is really important. And number nine, again, it's a bit like number one, talk about it. Don't just, just quietly get on in a little corner and do it. Uh, just say, well, I found this is good. 
Uh, if you tried this as well, I mean, whatever. So as I say, there's, there's something there, there's a leaflet there that you can take away with you, and uh, maybe you can follow up on the websites to find some more. It's a challenge for us, but we can do it. Okay. Methane is not as bad as carbon dioxide, principally because the carbon dioxide, as I said, has a very long lifetime. The time, lifetime of methane is about 10 years. So if we stopped producing, emitting methane now, in 10 years' time, the methane problem would have gone away. And it is molecule for molecule, it's more effective than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, but it is secondary because of this time scale. But we do need to tackle them all. And in some cases, tackling methane may be easier than tackling carbon dioxide. So where we can do it, we need to do it. So it's one of these things that just because it's, I put CO2 as the number one, it doesn't mean that numbers two, three, four, etc., aren't important. It certainly is very important. Um, I don't know if this is working, but, but where do you feel we are on carbon capture technology? Okay. Um, what sort of difference is going to make and, and when will it start kicking in? Carbon capture, which is what I was sort of referring to briefly back there, where you, is something where, which is done at small scale and all the pieces are there in the engineering to do it at big scale. But what needs to be done is to put them together at scale to see what the problems are and then probably the next generation after that would really be working. So the time scale for doing that is around 20 years or so. So that's why we need to start now, because we almost definitely need it. But we can't do it at scale now. But there's no reason we can't do it. And in fact, the UK, again, is very well set up for places to do this. In the North Sea, we have just the right sort of places to put that car, CO2, having been liquefied, such that we, uh, we, it won't reappear again. It will combine with the rock. talked about the, uh, the Act and Climate Change Act. What's the point of having a, an Act that is legally binding without any penalties? Well, I mean, I think there's discussion of this at the moment about what happens if our Prime Minister doesn't obey uh, law. And the, the point is that there is then, then can be a challenge in the courts. So the government could be taken to court, basically. But the Act doesn't contain any penalties. No, it doesn't contain any penalties. And in the end, I think in a democracy, again, it actually means it depends on this being an important issue for the people. If people say this is an important issue, the government of the day will cross it at its peril. Uh, yeah, and the judicial challenge, unless there's a penalty. So it's, it, it is difficult to have an act like this that says the government will go to prison for 10 years. I mean, who could it who are you going to put in prison? You certainly concentrate their mind. Well, that's right, yes. <laughs> and maybe it would do some of them some good. But, um, but uh, it, in the end, we actually have to think that we're a country that's run by parliament, by laws, and that people will obey those laws. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's You mean personally? Well, personally and <coughs> We have to, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where there's no silver bullet. If we do this one thing, we can forget all the others. So, I mean, I, as a country, the, we have to do something in buildings and transport very soon. 
and it is ridiculous what we're doing there. And the power sector, we have to <coughs> continue getting that down to zero um, in terms of our emissions there. So, sort of, and then you get the more difficult things like agriculture, where we're reducing the emissions, probably not to zero, we may need something to compensate, but reducing the emissions in agriculture is difficult. Um, and personally, I think it is actually thinking about everything you do and just saying, well, can I do that in a more low carbon way? And talking to others, including your councillors and your MPs. Okay, well, I will hang around afterwards. So. So I can't quite hear them. So. I have two electric tractors yes. that came from a factory. Um, the reason we're all driving now before we're driving now is because we're going to get into that safety rating system. We're driven to drive bigger and bigger cars. We're, we're changing our ways now. But are we left in a situation where we have so many rules and regulations about how a vehicle responds on the road for the safety? rather than concentrating on where everybody can be making a difference, making smaller vehicles, getting on the road. I personally can't afford a Tesla, so uh, I'll be making two of my tractors if possible. <laughs> and also using that for a business. Yeah. So we using electric power, possibly with windmill and um, solar. Well, I think in terms of electric vehicles, what we've seen is a start with the Teslas, but now all the car companies are desperately trying to get their cars out, which within a few years will be no more expensive than the old petrol one. So it's now becoming, it's come down to the person, the, the man or woman in the street, as being a nice option, which is no more expensive. And that, that is the way it's going um, over the next three years, you'll see it's no, no more difficult to buy that electric vehicle. And then the, the positives come, and I mean, the positives come not just from the CO2, it comes from air quality and all, you know, all the way around. I mean, it's incredibly pleasant vehicles to drive and it's pleasant to be around those. So I don't think the regulations that we have will stop the electric vehicles coming in. If the petrol vehicles or the diesel could meet those regulations, the electric vehicle can. The change in battery technology, again, is, is just amazing. And that's enabled these things to be no heavier, or they won't be much heavier than the previous version. So I think the changes in technology means it has come down to us all. Just as the mobile phone started off with those huge things that lasted five minutes before the battery went, you know, now there's more power on my phone in my pocket than on the supercomputer I used 30 years ago. You know, it's this amazing change, and that change has enabled us to do this. Okay, thank you very much for answering those questions. I'm sure there are lots more. We have to move on, though. We have a very tight schedule today. I would once again like to thank you, Mr. Brian, for coming along, uh, talking to us, and answering the questions. And I know you'll be willing afterwards 